Hello, Sally and I welcome you to Streams of Living Water flowing today from the study in our home. Do you know how you ought to pray? I guarantee that you don't. Do you know how to breathe? Yes and no. Today, we're going to find out how. My name is Pastor David Burkadal. My wife, Reverend Sally Welch, and I are co-producing these videos, Streams of Living Water, to share a sense of connection and encouragement and an opportunity to reflect on what it means to be a Christian in our turbulent times. Turbulent times can refer to navigating rough waters, being pulled in many directions, threatening us with being pulled off course, and crashing. Turbulent times can also refer to the turbulent waters that are the streams of living water that is the Bible's metaphor for the Holy Spirit in both the Old and the New Testament, calling, equipping us, and sending us back onto the course for which we were created, the course that leads us to eternal life. Sally and I are retired clergy with over 80 years of ordained ministry experience between the two of us. Jesus tells us about prayer and how it's connected to breathing in Luke chapter 11, verses 1 through 13. He's on his way to Jerusalem with his disciples to die. Jesus had been praying when they asked him what seems to us a strange question in verse 1. He was praying in a certain place, and after he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John taught his disciples. Okay, we learned from this that Jesus' disciples, who had been with him for three years, seeing him pray, worshiping in synagogues and in the temple, didn't know how to pray themselves. Or at least they believed that Jesus could teach them something about how to pray. We also know that John the Baptist had his own disciples, separate from Jesus' disciples. We know that he taught them how to pray, and we know that Jesus' disciples wanted the same curriculum. And Jesus answers them in what seems to us an odd way. He doesn't give them a class on how to pray. He gives them a format. He might as well have said, just do it. He says, when you pray, in verse 2. He said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. He doesn't offer a manual or a seminar. He offers us a model. I used to run for fitness and competed in 5K and 10K races from time to time. And in the 70s, I actually ran two marathons, but I think I mainly ran the second marathon because I forgot how bad I felt after the first one. One of the first magazines specializing in running was Runner's World. And I subscribed. Dr. George Sheehan, one of the first sports doctor and himself a runner, wrote a column answering runners' questions. One of them had to do with how to breathe. In the mid-70s, there was some controversy over whether runners should breathe through their nose or breathe through their mouth. And someone wrote a question to Dr. Sheehan asking him to settle the issue. His answer was, breathe through your nose. Breathe through your mouth. Suck it in through your ears if you can, but get it in there. Jesus offers a similar answer to the question of how to pray. His answer begins, when you pray. He continues with what we know as the Lord's Prayer, going on with verse 3. Give us each day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone indebted to us and do not bring us to the time of trial. Can we only pray for bread? On what basis can we ask God to forgive our sins, big and little, and the separation from God that they produce? Does God lead us into the time of trial or into temptation? I'm glad you asked, but I'm not going to answer those questions. Instead, I'm going to recommend that you buy a copy of Martin Luther's Small Catechism, a pamphlet-sized book which he wrote to provide answers to the basic questions of the Christian faith, kind of a what every Christian should know. You can buy a copy online, or you can download a copy from the Google Play Store or from the Apple App Store. 
Concordia Publishing has one, and I've heard that Augsburg Fortress is planning to bring theirs back, and it's free. The Christian life is not just knowing answers, though. It's living them. We are sinners and deserve to experience the just consequences of our sin. But God is merciful, and we see how, beginning with verse 5. And he said to them, Suppose one of you has a friend, and you go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread, for a friend of mine has arrived, and I have nothing to set before him. And he answers from within, Do not bother me. The door has already been locked, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and get you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, at least because of his persistence, he will get up and give him whatever he needs. So, is prayer wearing God down to get what we want? Like, a child who begs to go to the beach, please, 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 until they're so annoying that you say, okay, we'll go. Jesus encourages us to pray with confidence in God's power and goodness, starting with verse 9. So I say to you, ask and it will be given you. Search and you will find. Knock and the door will be open for you. For everyone who asks receives. And everyone who searches finds, and for everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. So, is prayer a magic formula, like in Harry Potter, where you just have to wave a wand and say something in Latin and it happens? Some people say so. At least that's the way they act. They think that God is like their personal cosmic bellboy, their servant. And they are grossly disappointed when God doesn't come through. They say, God didn't answer my prayer. The thing is, though, that no is an answer. Wait until the time is right is an answer. Yes is an answer, too. For some, it's the only answer. Entitlement can be the attitude of some Christians, too. Ruth Graham, Billy Graham's wife, once said, God has not always answered my prayers. If he had, I would have married the wrong man several times. How does God answer our prayers? Jesus answers in verse 11. Is there anyone who among you, if your child asks for a fish, will give a snake instead of a fish? Maybe a filet of fish sandwich or some fish and chips would be more appetizing, but you get the idea. He continues in verse 12. Or if the child asks for an egg, we'll give a scorpion. No parent would do that. What does that tell us about prayer? He answers in verse 13. If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Uh, wait a minute. I was hoping for something more practical. Uh, is that what people pray for? Is that what you pray for? The Holy Spirit? The thing is that all Christians are God's saints. But we are also sinners, separated from God by our sin. We don't know how to pray as we ought. As Paul writes to the church at Rome in Romans chapter 8, verses 26 and 27, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought. But that very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. And God, who searches the heart, knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. We don't know how to pray. But the Spirit helps us in our weakness. And how does the Spirit pray? According to the will of God. God knows what we need before we ask. We are telling God something that God doesn't already know when we pray. We ask only that God's will be done. Praying is talking with God. I once heard of the South Korean pastor of what was then the largest church in the world, the Reverend Dr. Paul Young-Gi Cho saying that he routinely got up before dawn 
and prayed for several hours. And he instructed his assistant pastors to pray for three hours a day. An interviewer commented that he wouldn't know what to say for three hours. Pastor Cho said that he wouldn't either. At some point, he had to stop and listen. What do we say when we talk to people? We don't talk all the time. What we say and what we hear depends upon our relationship with them. How close are we? Do we trust them? Do we have a past together? How familiar are we with one another? People pray based on what they believe God to be. Some believe that God is a stern judge, a punisher, displeased, angry, and strict. Jesus portrays God as a father, a good father, a father who knows how to give the best gift, the Holy Spirit, the key to understanding everything to his children. You may have seen the bumper sticker or the bracelet or the slogan that says, prayer changes things. I don't believe that. I don't believe that prayer changes things. I believe that God changes things. God changes us. In fact, we are so changed that it is like we are born again. We are made new. We are a new creation. It makes us long not for what we want, but for God's will to be done. Prayer is life in a relationship with God. It is speaking and listening for the will of God in the Holy Spirit. Have you ever talked with someone and then come to silence when everything that needs to be said has been said and you are content just to be with them? Likewise, prayer doesn't even require words, heard or spoken. Sometimes it is just being with God. In both Hebrew and Greek, the languages of the Old and New Testament respectively, one word, noima in Greek and ruach in Hebrew, have the same three meanings, wind, breath, and spirit. We breathe to live. The Holy Spirit is the new life of God at work within us, not something we have earned, but something we receive as a gift of God's grace. It is all we need to live as the body of Christ and all that is necessary to be the people of God, the living body of Christ. The world scoffs at thoughts and prayers in response to life's catastrophes. We do it ourselves when we say things like, well, the only thing we can do now is pray. For us, prayer is life. It is listening as well as speaking. It leads us to doing God's will, which is God's justice. It is as necessary for the life of the church as is breathing. It is the breath of the Holy Spirit. Prayer leads us to do God's will, that is, God's justice. Think about all the things that the disciples had seen Jesus accomplish over the three years that they were with him in his public ministry. What was the one thing that they asked him to teach them how to do? Pray. Do you know how you ought to pray? We have his answer. Let us pray. We thank you, Lord, that you have filled us with your Holy Spirit. We pray that each day we may open our hearts to be filled and defined by that same Spirit, that we might pray in the Spirit, that the Spirit might intercede for us with sighs too deep for words, that we may hear and speak through that same Spirit, that we might in all things know and do your will. Gracious God, you are the Savior of the world. May all hearts turn to you and seek your ways of reconciliation and peace for all. May greed of all kinds come to an end. May hunger of all kinds come to an end. May your light fill every corner of this world. May the hostilities in Ukraine come to an end in a way that promotes the sovereignty and well-being of that nation. May your blessing and good be poured out upon the people of Russia, and may they seek to do your will for all people. We ask this in the name of the Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ, our Lord. We pray for Dean George Pandua and his wife Esther, for our brothers and sisters in Tanzania, particularly in the new church at the Kawa, for Jeff and Stephen and Chris and Whitney and Pat and Julie and Rob and Joe and Peggy and Ricky and Lindy and Will, 
for lasting peace in the Middle East, particularly in Afghanistan, and for our armed forces who have served there and in Iraq, for recovery for Haiti, for an end to the pandemic throughout the world, for an end to the tragedies at our borders, for all those who are suffering as a result of the recent inclement weather, and that all may come to life and peace and salvation in you. We ask these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. And let's also remember to pray the Lord's Prayer sometime today, the one that Jesus taught us. If you don't know what that is, contact us at the Revs David and Sally at gmail.com or send us a tweet to at David Burkadal and we'll send it to you. Send your comments, your concerns, your questions to those same addresses and we'll respond to every one. As always, we encourage you to stay hydrated, to allow the streams of living water, the Bible's metaphor for the Holy Spirit, to flow through you, to guide you, to open you and nourish you and allow you to see God's presence within you and all around you in your daily lives. If you are a member of a local church, support that church. Let your pastor know you're praying for him or her. Support your church leaders with your time, your treasure, your talent. Strengthen them as they try and guide us through these uncharted seas in order to bring us to port as God has equipped and sent us into the world to do. They're trying to please everybody. You know that that just is impossible. So do everything you can to support them and pray for them. If you are struggling with mental illness or thoughts of suicide, contact somebody. There are professionals all around you. There are hotlines, local and national. Reach out to a friend or a family member, a professional. There are people all around you who will walk with you through this hard time into the better life I know is coming for you. Remember to wear your mask or masks, wash or sanitize your hands, avoid crowds if possible, maintain social distancing if it's not possible. But most importantly, get your vaccines and your boosters. It's the one thing you can do that will most help to literally save lives and move us back on track toward regaining our footing into the world that is God's will for all people, the abundant life that is God's desire for all. Be kind to everyone you come into contact with today. Everyone struggles in some way. Everyone is trying to find their way through unfamiliar territory. Be a person who encourages them, who points to God and the strength that God can give all people to lead them into the future that is God's will for them. Be an encourager. Finally, let us receive the blessing of God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.